Welcome to American Slacker Podcast. As always, I'm Matt. And I am Jesse, and today we are joined by our guest cinematographer, director, producer, Mike Petchy. Thanks for coming on, man. What's happening, guys? I'm happy to be here. Glad to have you, man. Would you mind uh, telling our audience a little bit about yourself, giving them an idea of what you do? Sure. I have been a director now for about 19 years, so I do commercials, music videos, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, I also do some film work, so I've got... um, two films in development uh in los angeles right now that hopefully after covid they'll go into green light uh i tend to be a bit more of a horror movie guy and i I like to scare people i think it's because i'm an older brother and i used to be a piece of shit to my younger (laughs) siblings um so i enjoyed see like carrying that piece of shit sort of attitude to audiences (laughs) and like uh, teasing the shit out of audiences which i think is fun um and then in, in, in my downtime, I, uh, I'm a hobbyist uh, barbecue guy, so I have a, uh, a smoker and I eat enough uh, meat to probably murder myself before I can actually make one of these movies. So it's good. She got to balance that ratio of filmmaking to meat eating. <laughs> make sure you're yeah. around enough to keep making these films, man. Yeah. <laughs> That's what my producers keep saying. Well, look at it, your Instagram. You're going to murder yourself before you get it to the Oh yeah, my mouth was watering. Yeah, I was yeah. just looking at your story and doing some ribs and other other pork parts. It looks like. Yeah, man, I got into. It's funny. You probably know this because you're in the same business. Like, you decide early on that you want to get into filmmaking business. It's such a it's such a feat. It's it's like literally I'm going to walk up the side of Mount Everest in sneakers, and so uh, getting to that mindset of like i have to just be working on this all day and this is what it is and then you love movies you're immersed with movies you're watching movies all the time um and so you kind of drive yourself crazy and it wasn't until years later uh that someone was like what do you do and i'm like i'm a director and i make movies and stuff and they go yeah what do you do for fun it's like i do movies and stuff that's fun they're like yeah but what's your hobby and i'm like oh I don't know. <laughs> uh, Tough question. And so, <laughs> yeah, I know. And it was good advice. They're like, you need a hobby. You need to be able to get out of the business. And so I got into uh, barbecuing and I got into smoking because it's like something really relaxing about cooking. And cooking to me is like doing a movie on a smaller scale. Because if you're making a meal for people, you're sort of designing their experience. You're designing their emotional experience with the food that you're serving them. So it's, it's almost identical uh, to doing directing. It's just different technique. Um, and uh, I really dig it. And like last week on the podcast, I had, um, always actually comes out this week, but I recorded it last week. I had uh, chef Tom from all things barbecue and him and I just fucking ranted about how cool it is to uh, serve things to people. Uh, and so I like it. <laughs> that's, that's like fun. a real shitty way to end that story well, what no, I like it's a fun, it is a fun hobby and it's a way to nourish people and i've heard you know a lot of chefs do it out of out of love because it's like it's an act of love to like you know cook something for someone put care into it time into it and then nourish yeah. their body so that they can keep fucking living like that's if you think about it at a very base level it's one of the few things that we need as humans so it's deep like it's yeah. deep instinct at that point i feel like that's the first like community thing that existed was sharing food. Like it's how you show you're like together, you know? True. It's wild. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, those are two very gentle ways of putting it. I think the most crass way that I put it is it's the closest thing to fucking your buddies. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. I like this whole yin yang thing we got going here with food. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's like, I'm going to give you that same orgasmic experience. And you're putting Uh, something in their mouth, you know? Exactly. (laughs) Putting your meat in their mouth, you know? (laughs) You know, and I'm not ch- I'm not changing my sexual orientation while doing it, so it's good. <laughs> no big life changes, just, you know, a couple seasonings. <laughs> 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 so you mentioned your podcast, too. Uh, that it's, it's 
over 80 episodes now. So congrats on almost being at that hundred episode mark. Yeah, we're getting close, man. And uh, it's called In Love with the Process. Uh, what what's what's behind the name? Um, and and what's it really about? Well, so uh, the longer story about it is that at this point it was like six years ago, seven years ago. I don't know. It's time. I feel like I'm sleeping in a DeLorean. I feel like I'm just going through time at this point. Um, but uh, I was in the middle of a great career as a director for music videos and commercials. Um, and then I had a near death experience. I ended up going on a date and going ice skating for the first time. And uh, I slipped on the ice and I cracked my skull open oh, and I ended up in intensive care with like a hematoma and uh, severe. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? My brain just fucking stopped. I'm fully healed by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I was having like crazy visions and all this stuff. And I was trapped in intensive care for about five days. And then I had five months of recovery. Wow. Uh, and there were multiple times where the doctor came in and they were like, we can't let you go to sleep. If you go to sleep, you might not wake up, that kind of thing. And so you're confronted with death, essentially. And in that place where, where I was, I just was looking back on my life. And if you're in this business your life is kind of defined by like these little flagpoles of like, that's when I did this project and that's when I did this project and that's when I did this project because it takes up so much of your time. And I was sort of assessing it and going like, if that's how I'm looking at my life if by these little flagpoles that I'm really not living my life as, as hard as I could be. And if all I'm doing this work for is that to stand on the stage and go, Hey guys, look what I made if that's the only reason why I'm doing it, then that literally happens like 1% of my life yeah. is that, is that little moment. And so then I had to really sort of examine it and go like, well, i love, what do I love about this job? I love everything about this job. I love going on location scouts. I love prep. I love meeting people. I love doing podcasts. I love all these different aspects of it. Um, and so I wanted the show to just be an appreciation of all of these really great steps and an appreciation of the, the process because the process is the job. Mm. And if you're living that job, then the process is your life. And so then my priorities ended up changing and it wasn't like I got to make the best movie and everything is all about the final product. And everything's about that. For me at this point, it's I want to get into the position in which I can start a project and then live a whole new process, live a whole new life based upon that job. Um, and so that's what I really wanted the show at its core to be about. And that's kind of what the title's about. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating. The more people that I talk to, like I just interviewed John Wick's uh, director of photography. I just interviewed, um, uh, Greg Frazier who shot Rogue One and all that stuff last week. Wow. Um, and these guys all feel the same way. And as you talk to them and they've been in the business longer, they sort of get to this point where, uh, they, they realize that the actual movie isn't as important as all the relationships that you've made along the way, as all the life experiences that you've had. And in our business, if you go into our business expecting to make fucking money, <laughs> you go into our business expecting to make like a lot of cash, then it's kind of the wrong reason to do it. Yeah. Um, what this business affords us is the ability to go on crazy adventures, meet really interesting people. And especially if you do documentary work, and let you get access to stuff and make your own opinions on how life actually works. So you could like subvert the advertising fucking, you know, bullshit media train that's thrown at everybody. And you can make your own opinions, which is really nice. That, that's such an important thing because with the amount of time that it takes to do some of these things, if you're blowing, and I mean, you know, this, this seems to translate to even people's lives on the daily, you know, they may not be in the entertainment field or something, but they got that nine to five and they're just going, putting in those eight, eight and a half hours or whatever, coming home, <laughs> doing the same thing, doing it again. You know, you could blow through your whole life just waiting to get to that, that point, but, and it might not even ever come. And furthermore, I feel like you have a good way of like restoking the fire with every project instead of getting burnt out. It's like, just keep that fucking train chugging, baby. Cause it's like, you got a new method every time you're looking for new ways to adapt. Like 
there's something more interesting to keep the mind in the game instead of like running like that fucking automation that you just, yeah. that's the Going thing that motions type of thing. Yeah. 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 In our business, there's no such thing as an automation because it's con- consistently shifting and there are so many different variables and no matter how much work you do, no matter how good you are at making movies or telling stories, there are like thousands and thousands of variables that will just derail that idea. And then further that you can have the most amazing experience making something and, and literally create the work that you feel like is definitive of your time. And then uh, some sort of social event that has absolutely nothing to do with you will jade the audience's perspective mm. on your work. And so if you're I mean, a good example of that was that uh, I think the hunt movie that was coming out recently, it was that horror movie. And then there was a, a mass shooting and they like yeah. postponed it because like literally you can't even like you, and how many years went into putting into that movie not that that not to minimize the the loss of life with the shooting or anything but like the, yeah that totally. was, was people's careers putting into this film only to be uh, postponed or put off and and if you're in it just for that that gratification mm-hmm. if you're in it for that end point that at that point like <laughs> At that point, the filmmakers probably went out and bought shotguns. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> like it, it, as tasteless as that is. But you, you just don't. If if that's the reason why you're doing it, um, you're you're setting yourself up for failure, and you're setting yourself up for for misery. And I think there's a reason why a lot of people in our industry uh, turn to alcohol and turn to that because you're putting so much weight on the result. Mm. And and mm. in our world. There's so much rejection uh, and there's rejection that's going to happen no matter what. I don't care who the fuck you are. You could be George Miller um, and pro- have proven yourself over the years and still get rejected. Mm-hmm. Guillermo del Toro has like, what, 40 or 50 unproduced finished scripts and movies that were ready to go that he just got rejected on. Damn. Um, and so it, it, it's a shitty business because you're, constantly dealing with rejection and you're constantly trying to get yourself back up. Someone told me once that the, the main job of a director is, is having someone say, fuck you, you can't do it. And then just totally take a dream from you and then get back up and then come up with a new dream and make something new after that. And that's, that's what this job is. And so, um, I was talking to, um, Solomon, who was just on my latest episode, uh, Solomon Luthelm, who's like a really great director, commercial director. And I think he had, I think it was him. I think he had a good quote where he was like, what I try to do, it was either him or it was uh, Ryan Booth. Either way. The director was like, what I would try to do is every year I'll print out all my treatments that I wrote because uh, what happens at the end of the year, you sort of look back and go, what did I do all year? How many projects did I direct? And most of the time, it's like two or three different projects. And you're like, fuck, I, I kind of failed. But he'll print out all these treatments that got rejected. And he'll look at those as movies. And he'll look at those as commercials and be like, look, I've been working my fucking ass off. Just because they didn't get produced doesn't mean that I didn't visualize them. Doesn't mean that I didn't do all that, like, 30% of the work. Oh, and you probably learned stuff. something in all of those rejected ideas. That, that you've done sure. you learn how to do something one way or not to do something another way um that might help you not get rejected next time i would hope yeah 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 and then uh, oftentimes like i'll have ideas or techniques that i'm just cherry picking cherry picking because i really love them and it's like oh well this will work for this thing so let me grab that grab this and grab that so I, it's it's not wasted so i guess my in my sunday morning fucking rant here um, I think if, as long as you're in love with the process of doing that stuff, as long as you're in love with the rhythms that you've set for yourself and your friends, and you really sort of appreciate like doing research and finding inspiration and cultivating this inspiration and hanging out with folks and talking and figuring things out and observing life. So that way as a storyteller, you're actually giving back what you've seen. Um, then it's fun. And then that's the life and, and it's rewarding at that point. If those are your expectations 
and if you if you're successful, which time in you probably will be, mm-hmm. um, then you're just sort of like, wow, this is cherry on the fucking cake, and everybody's like, how does it feel to be an overnight success? And you're like, Go fuck <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. People tell you you're lucky. That's that's my favorite one. Yeah, it's oh, like you're so lucky. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah. Well, you didn't see all the the work behind that luck, mm-hmm. but okay. <laughs> But, but as long as you're in that mindset, then you just don't care. Mm-hmm. And, and then it's nice. It's nice because then life is good. And then you're not a piece of shit to the people that you're around and people like to be around you. Um, it's not easy by any means. And mm-hmm. it's a daily struggle to stay in that mindset. Um, but that's what I try to promote on the podcast. And, and the podcast actually does a good job keeping me in check because I'm talking to a lot of folks and, mm. and they give me great advice. So it's a good, it's a fun show. It's a really fun show. I was going to say, it's a very informational. If you're somebody who's into the arts, you know, of creating anything that with film or whatever, like you can get so many lessons out of, you know, what to avoid from people that are experts. You know, I mean, there's a lot of fucking useful information on your show. And I really enjoy that compared to like, I, use, I listen to a lot of comedy, a lot of that, but you don't really take anything away besides, you know, laughing here and there. But sure. again, you know, anything like that is just, I mean, that's fucking better than school. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there's things you're going to learn in there that you might not even learn. It's like a master work. class. Like get exactly. Some of the people that you pull in. They've been through the shit. Like you yeah, learn from yeah. them, you know, generals. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm kind of a fucking moron because I don't charge for it. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> get at his Patreon, people. <laughs> yeah. So like I'm kind of an idiot for it. But I feel like I'm doing a good service for our industry because there's so many talented young folks uh, that I know that I love that uh, make the mistake of, of going to like a film school Mm -hmm. uh, without a purpose. And you come out of film school with like a massive fucking debt and you're expected in this business to work for free for like fucking three years. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. so um, I always feel really bad for folks like Liam, who's my, um, Now he's an associate producer. He started as an assistant on the show and an intern. Um, But he's got debt. He's got lots of student loan debt. I remember the first I talked to him uh, in his junior year, and he was like, what kind of advice do you have? I was like, drop out of school. (laughs) (laughs) I listened to that first episode, actually, yeah. (laughs) Drop out of school. Don't tell your parents I told you this, but drop out of school. (laughs) Well, I mean, you can get a lot of hands-on experience, which seems to be a lot more practical if you can save yourself the money from what it sounds like. Sure. And if you're like, if your parents or if you get a loan, Jesus Christ, if you get a loan that's like 70 grand a year or 65,000 a year, make a, make a, make a short, make a proof of concept a year, two Mm. a year. Um, And then not only are you learning and not only are you building connections, um, but then you're actually creating material that can stand for you that can actually represent you um and as a director that's really important uh creating content that shows your tone shows your voice um that's really difficult to do and and once you sort of master that stuff then you become valuable Mm. and then when you're out pitching on things or you're out um putting in ideas for scripts uh, it, you'll, it'll get you agents, it'll get you management because they physically have something that they can sell you with. Right. And it isn't mm-hmm. just like, this guy's really good. Oh yeah? yeah. How do I know he's really good? It's <laughs> a good point. You got to have something to, to prove that. Yeah. And they yeah. get your style all in one, one flash, which is nice. They know what you're going to, you're capable of and what, you, what it's going to come out as. Yep. Yep. So, yep. Uh, yeah, I was going to say one thing that seems to be coming up as the theme then uh, that you touched on before is about the if you go into this to make money versus you go into this with like a passion for what you're doing, the it sounds like the money could come eventually, but it won't without the passion. Like you can't go and you can't sit down and be like, let me write a script that's going to make a million dollars. I no. mean, good <laughs> fucking luck, bro. Yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> No, you don't do that. You don't do that. But it's it's a fascinating thing. Like, you have to be... Oh, by the way, that sound in the background is a parrot down the street that apparently likes to mimic its owner having sex. So oh, that nice. Means, 
That is what that noise is. Um, <laughs> I thought it was paired sex, but you know. That's a uh, short right there, you know? <laughs> dude, it's ridiculous. It drives me insane. Um, what was I saying? Uh, We're saying but, yeah, in this, in this business, you have to do a hundred different things in order to survive. Mm-hmm. And you, especially early on in the game. And I think the more things you do, and what I like to tell people on the show is go PA, go get yourself on set, go get yourself in a post-production facility, wherever it is that you want to be and look around and spend that time sort of having the veil lifted because we all look at this from the outside and we look at like some fucking douchebag, fucking YouTube influencers, goddamn content where it's just like, I'm a sweet bro. I travel all over the fucking place. I got <laughs> chicks. I got this sweet camera. My life is so fucking amazing. And so we have such a generation of folks that are turning to YouTube to learn, which is a great fucking place for that. They turn to YouTube to learn, turn to YouTube for tutorials and all that kind of influencers that are on there that are shaping what the illusion of what filmmaking is. And I think it's really important for you early on, if you want to get into this business, to actually physically go do it and to be on set and and, and see what a director actually does. Mm. You can see that like the whole action cut is like 2% of your life. There's like so much more other shit. Like how are you navigating what the producers are? How are you navigating what the the creatives are saying? How are you navigating your own insecurities? Um, And when you see that happening live, that really changes your perception of it. And you're like, oh, maybe I don't want to be a director, but that fucking dude with the headphones on over there, that seems like a cool job. Yeah. Or, you know, that guy that's got that fucking sweet belt of utility shit and he's pushing that other guy around on that dolly, that job looks fun because those guys are having a fucking blast every day. That's an interesting job. Um, so I, th- I encourage it. I think that one of the U.S.'s biggest exports is still f- entertainment. Um, it's what we still create here. And there's so many really great jobs involved with that. Uh, really main jobs. So look around, see what it's like, and then make your decision off of that, you know? Now, for say someone, you know, there's that high schooler who just graduated, and they're they're taking your advice. They're like, "Fuck film school, I want to I want to do this myself." Um, they they can possibly get on a set. Say they're more interested in like in writing. Um, yep. Is that I've always wondered myself because like I I studied a little bit of writing in, in school, but they never actually taught you how to sell your script. They they'll teach you how to write one. But they never actually teach you, like, what, what is the next step? So, like, say there is someone out there with a script listening who wants to get it in the hands to actually be made. What's that process like? It's a fast – because writing is such a – writing is the exception. Writing is such a, such a lonely job. Because you're gem- so and you're generally – in your own space, in your own world. My screenplay writer right now, Will Simmons, he's written up the, uh, the past two features that we have going out to market. Um, <laughs> when quarantine happened, he's like, it doesn't make a difference to me. He's <laughs> consistently in a bunker. He's consistently just doing his shit. Uh, but what he does really well is he, he's created a system for himself. And he's created a healthy sort of system in which he writes certain parts of the day. He researches certain parts of the day. Mm-hmm. He understands how to set himself up to be a great writer. And I think a lot of people look at writing and they look at the blank page and they go, I have, I have, I've got to get these ideas out. There are so many exercises that you should do, you know, and practice exercises as far as like how to write, how to form, like how to format, how to keep your brain functioning the way it's supposed to function, mm-hmm. how to get yourself in a rhythm. Um, and then beyond that, like anything in our industry, writing, physically writing a screenplay is probably like 45, 50% of it. Then there's the, how do I, how do I interact with producers? How do I interact with literary agents? 
How do I write an email? How do I craft an email that mm -hmm. sets up the reading experience for people? Like there's so much stuff that's involved. And I think a lot of times I've seen, I've actually seen Will do it a lot, where he'll do minor changes in a script and doesn't necessarily agree with all the notes that he got, but he'll mm -hmm. craft a fucking email that is just beautiful. And the people reading that email will literally forget about all their notes, forget about all their shit that they originally had in that draft and, and have the email in their head when they're reading it again, go, this is fucking great. And it's just because of how he set it up. Um, is that like so a further explanation of the ideas you mean in the email? Yeah. But also like, also like, so a finesse, it sounds like, yeah, yeah. like it, it's, it's like <laughs> serving someone a plate of food. Yeah. Mm. Right. So like if I, if I put a, an excellent plate of food in front of you, um, and if it's like a fucking cheeseburger with French fries and shit, and you're just like, yeah, I've always wanted this cheeseburger and French fries. You're going to eat that. Well, maybe you don't want to make cheeseburger and fucking French fries all the time. And you know it's an easy sell, you know, but you don't want to make that all the time. Maybe you want to make um, like coffee rubbed like beef Rich. cheek. Yeah, okay. You know what I mean? And it's like beef cheek. And so if you put that down on the table and someone goes, this is beef cheek, they're going to go like, well, fuck that. I don't want to eat beef cheek for, mm. for some stupid reason, even though it comes from the same animal, even though it still tastes like steak, even yeah. though it has all that stuff. But if I'm going to put that down on the table and I sort of preface it by saying, this is the most tender portion of the cow that you've ever had. This is better than filet mignon. This is literally going to shred. Mm. And I've gone through the process of crafting this with, with coffee and salts and seasons and spices, and you're going to taste all those complexities in there. Um, so really enjoy this. And this is how I'm really proud of what I've done with this because when I eat this, I feel this and this and this and this and this, mm. and it really fucking excites me. And so then you serve that plate to somebody and you don't even tell them it's beef cheek. You serve that plate to them and they're like, this is amazing. What kind of meat is this? And you're like, believe it or not, that's beef cheek that you're eating. They they're, they got it in their mouth already at that point. <laughs> so it's it's about the setup. It's about hmm. um, how you sell how, it, right? Setting the stage, hmm. setting the palette, being capable um, of overselling, but overselling with sugar. Like <laughs> you know, it's that's that's quite an intricate art you'd have to master and i feel like that takes some time especially well, something as introverted as like a writing position because you mm. normally think don't think of that as like the person who can charismatically uh sway someone but i guess through an email if you have a way with words mm -hmm. but i also say like so i think that an exercise that i think is really important for a writer is to be out of their cave is to literally be, and this is, I think, where hobbies are really important. I think you're, you, in order to write people, in order to be a man writing a woman, you actually have to know women and you actually have to physically know their experiences and understand those experiences. And if you're just a guy that's sitting in his place and banging out the stuff that you love, like, I love fucking Die Hard, and you're instead of banging those things out, mm -hmm. and then you hit a point where it's like, well, he needs a wife or he needs a girlfriend or maybe it's a woman that's John McClane in this piece. Then you're like, how does she, what? And so that's why I think a lot of men have trouble writing women because they don't physically hang out with women or have women in their lives. And so I think it's a pretty typical thing to see them just take a character that's written for a man and go, well, it's a chick. So I'll just swap that and make mm -hmm. that what it is. Where I always say like, do yourself a favor, take a cooking class. Play it. Play a fucking sport. Or play like a weekend sport. Uh, you know, I don't know. Do fucking yoga. Do anything that puts you around other human beings as a writer. And uh, you know, go volunteer at like a you know a homeless shelter or an Alcoholics Anonymous fucking thing. Just so that you're seeing these people and you're understanding their stories and you start to understand their. their their mannerisms and how they process their stress. And you got to, you're training yourself to be more empathetic. You're training yourself to understand how humans work a bit more. And I think that's important. Uh, 
And then as far as like, how do you, how do you craft things to get people to be interested in them? Take a speaking class, Hmm. take a conversational class, go intern as a young writer, go intern for a producer because all the interns read the scripts first Hmm. and they end up being script readers. And then they have to write up like little book reports essentially Mm -hmm. and hand them to the producers because the producers never have the time to read all the scripts. Right. So there's a, there's a bunch of ways. If you really examine how the industry works, there's a bunch of ways that you can kind of hack it Mm -hmm. and learn all these different tricks and techniques. And then you're standing on top of all these other writers that are at home, just like, Oh, and then they, you know, you sit down and have a beer with them and they're fucking crazy. And it's such a, uh, non-linear path <laughs> in terms of how to get into those positions, it seems like, or even ha- this knowledge. Like, it, that's not anything they're going to really teach you in school necessarily. Uh, it's it's not, you're not going to really find that laid out for you in an infographic online, you know? That's going to no. be on the ground or hearing it from someone who's done it. At the end of the day, you just have to remember that if you're in the storytelling business, you're essentially communicating what you've experienced in life. And so then if you understand that, then it's like, okay, how can I, how can I be getting the most out of my life experiences? You know, and if you, if you want to write about certain things, if you want to make movies about certain things, then how do I embed myself into those worlds so that I can learn about that stuff? Um, I think that's, that's super fucking important. Mm. When, when you have like all these different uh, creative inspirations that hit you, I had been listening to one of your episodes where you talked about uh, having like an ideas folder type of thing to kind of come back to inspiration and stuff like that. How do you know when it is the right time to jump on an, an idea? Cause if they're coming at you so often, like, how do you know, like, oh, you know what? This would make a great uh, short film or, oh, this would be a good podcast topic or, you know, is there is there a process that you have in terms of deciding, like, this is going to be a short or this is going to be a feature? Or is it just something that you feel when you're... I, I think the trick is half the time with my inspiration folder, it's just I'm cataloging things that I see that I like. Right. So then they're just riding in the back of your head and and oftentimes i'll end up picking something that is more relevant to me at that moment maybe it's something that i just saw or maybe i just recently gone through the stuff um but it's funny because it just stays it stays back in there like um a good story is for the new Zarface video I, i just did a new music video and i haven't done apparently this covid out there um I hadn't done a music video in like 10 years, um, really. And so I was asked by Zarface to do a new music video and they had uh, Tom Segura interested in being on the music video. And I've been a big fan of his podcast, like Your Mom's House is a great podcast. Love it. Oh, so totally, yeah. I kind of came out of, I kind of came out of retirement for that because I was like, all right, yeah, I'll do it. And they oh, you're out. The they track. pulled you back in. <laughs> yeah. They sent me the track, and what I love about those guys is that they don't really give – they let me do whatever the, what I want Nice, because I've proven myself. So they sent me the track, and it really sort of clicked in really quick for me. I, I listened to the track, and I know Tom Segura's show, and I know that I'd have access to his stage, and I was like, his show reminds me of Twin Peaks, reminds me of David Lynch. Let's do something that's Twin Peaksy and David Lynch. And I know because of my experience – I know that I'm only going to have these guys for three hours. I'll have those guys for four hours. So let me design a lighting setup that I could do in like 15 minutes and be able to shoot all the coverage based upon that. So then logistically, you're sort of putting all these puzzle pieces together. And then you're like, okay, so 15 minutes, what, what can I do for lighting for that? Well, over my experience, I know the wider I get, the longer it takes. Mm-hmm. So I want to be in tight. I want to be in like super tight for a lot of my coverage. So that way I can literally build a blacked out tent in a waiting room okay. and then literally put someone inside that tent and shoot that stuff. Cause I know I'm not going to have a studio. I know I'm not going to have any of that shit. I'm literally going to be shooting in hotel rooms and stuff. Oh wow. So I went through the process of thinking about all that. And then I'm like, what's the last close up that I really dug 
that I thought was cool. And I know that Seamus from that band is a super nerd and an 80s film nerd. And I was like, Escape from New York. Ah, okay. That bit where uh, Snake is in the fucking plane and he's piloting himself and that super close up the left. Yeah. And so I just grabbed that still image, sent that still image to my cinematographer, and I said, I'd like to do this, but we'll have the lights move. And that became the, pr- the premise for the. The video was really simple. It was like Twin Peaks, reversal comedy, <laughs> Escape from New York, uh, and some live coverage. And it was like a one-page document that people look at and they go, how's this going to be any good? And I'm like, oh, it will be. I've got it all in. That's the that's tough part is getting people, getting people on that same page half the time, I would imagine, conveying that message of, no, it's going to look great. That's the, that's the director's main, like, main fucking job. And sometimes you're really good at it. Sometimes you suck at it. Like I just got, I just got schooled. I'm working with like a really great concept artist. Uh, and he's jumping on to do uh, some prep work for my movie. And I've been so busy that I haven't been able to give it my fullest attention. Mm. So I've been like doing the podcast, doing everything else. And then I'll get emails from him and I'll go through and I'm sort of passively looking at his his sketches that he's sending me. And I'm like, I like this, but I don't like that. But the guy's working free. And so I don't want to be, you know, really hammering him with my shit. And so we've gone back and forth for like five emails. And he just, I have to write back to him. He just fucking schooled me like a day ago. He's like, <laughs> you need to be assertive. You need to be firm about your shit. Like he really fucking, he's right. He really yeah. schooled me. And I was like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I haven't been giving this my fullest attention. I will. I'll send you a fucking email with the word of God. And then let's make it happen. Mm-hmm. But you just, the thing about this business, is not like I learn a trick and then it just stays there. You're consistently falling off the wagon with all this stuff. And you're consistently like being humiliated. And then in that humility, just sort of going like, oh, okay, I have to learn. I have to go from here and, I'll be better next time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you so, say that's the biggest um, uh, or the best trait, I guess, that you could have as a director then is like <coughs> criticism? Yeah. To, excuse me. <coughs> yeah. To be, I always say that you'll get more people to do better work for you. If you literally walk on set, even if you already know the answers mm-hmm. and you walk on set with your talented crew and you go, guys, I really don't know what to do here. What do you think? And then people will step up because everybody wants to impress you. Everybody right. wants to make a good movie. And so they'll come up and they'll be like, what if we do this? What if we do that? What if we do this? And so then they become a lot more involved. Mm-hmm. Um, and through that process, you may hear something that you didn't even think about. You're like, yes, that's why we're doing this. It's fucking great. Or they may just come around to knowing what you already thought was the case and then just being able to go like, I can't believe you. that's a great idea. You came up with that fucking great idea. Let's do it. Um, and then understanding that if someone asks you to do something that you don't know how to mm-hmm. do it, instead of being that arrogant piece of shit where it's just like, well, I know what the fuck you have to just go like, guys, I just don't know. I physically don't know. I don't know how this scene's going to play out. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to be a mother giving birth to a child. I, I, just, I just don't know. And so I know what I like. I know what I emotionally want to feel from this. So can we just find somebody that is a professional at this to teach me how to do this sort of thing? Uh, that's, that's strong filmmaking. And I think a lot of people see saying, I don't know, is a weakness. Right. It's, it's totally not. Sometimes it's the it's, right answer. And it's such an empowering, and because if you come out and say, this is what it is, then conversation stops. Yep. Like it may, it may want to keep going. Someone may be like, yeah, but, and you're like, no, fuck off. This is the way it is. Then the conversation's done. And at that point, you're, you better be right. <laughs> you better be right. Uh, because you're the, you're the one that stopped it. And sometimes you have to do that as a director. Mm-hmm. It's come in and like, oh, guys, this is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. I know that there's a hundred different fucking ideas, but literally that's my job. I'm strapped to the front of this train. I'm going to make sure we don't hit anybody. Get out <laughs> of the way. We're going, we're going, we're going. Yeah. But if you're, if you're the other way, 
and you're like, I don't know, then you're discovering things and then you're learning about things. And then the process for you is a lot more fun. Mm. Mm. It's like a tough system. It feels like of like figuring out if like you could trust yourself. But you got to utilize like all the education of like in the moment, you know, like from the days of being to now, like it, it's a really tough system, but you got to know your scale of when you can trust yourself. And I feel like that's where you make it or break it in, in your industry, at least. Dude, on a daily basis. Yeah, and man. Like you guys are catching me. I had probably like seven hours of sleep last night, which is a good one. But you'll hit a point where. The way my sleep patterns, which are incredibly unhealthy, are is I'll get like a, a great amount of sleep. I'll do like a fucking eight hour, nine hour day of sleep. Then through the process of eight days, I will sort of fall back to like two or three hours worth of sleep. Ooh. And so you catch me on those three hour. I had three hours worth of sleep last night. I'm a goddamn moron. <laughs> so anything coming out of my mouth is got nothing to do with the hornet's nest that's going on inside my head. Yeah, yeah, dude. So like you Mm -hmm. have to give yourself credit, Like, just because I've had that experience, just because I know those things doesn't necessarily mean that where I am currently, I can, I can do all that shit. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And so so you're consistently like, I'm consistently putting my foot in my mouth. I'm consistently, uh, you know, fucking up, (laughs) but (laughs) You know, I, I also know that I can trust my my sense. I can trust my taste. I can I can trust the fact that if I can't figure it out, I'm just going to go do something else, and then I'll come back to it. And like muscle memory and instinct will kick in and go like that. That cuts too long, and like this angle's wrong, and this is how this stuff should should be and my brain will just click right back into it mm-hmm. and that's that's the 19 years that's the I, was, I was gonna say I was, uh, how many years in do you feel like you felt like this was it like 10 years in was it five years in was it something that came quick for you you know i feel like this is different for everybody of course but it's just it's interesting sure. to hear. i think statistically it's about eight to ten years where you start to like get to that point where um people start calling you for your work like you start to get some recognition for your work. Um, and if you're doing it a lot in that period of time, you start to trust yourself. And, and in that period of time, if you've done it correctly, you've, you've made things, you've screened things, you've had ups and downs, you've been humiliated, you've gone through that process where you can just go like, all right. And a lot of that is just learning. It's just saying like, mm. it's okay. I'm going to survive. Like if, if I showed something on a stage and I got up there and people started throwing fucking tomatoes at me and started booing at me, I know I'm going to walk off that stage and be fine. Yeah. And, and so you, you get that in you. And then once you get past that anxiety, once you get past that self doubt, although self doubt always creeps in, but once you get past mm-hmm. that anxiety, um, then you you are able to step out of that. So you're not in that mindset of like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is, because then that's such a uh, encompassing sort of distracting mindset, even if it's positive, where it's like, I can't believe I'm finally on set. I can't believe that there's this guy doing this for me. And then you're thinking about that. Once you have that ability to just sort of put that in front of your face and be able to think behind that, then that's where magic happens. That's where you're like, this is really exciting, but this and this and this and this and this. And then you start to actually see the code, you know, matrix style. And you're like, okay, mm. let's bring these elements together. Learning um, tunnel vision. <laughs> you have to have tunnel vision, man, with your art. Yeah, dude. Yeah. To a certain extent. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Honestly, the hardest hurdle for me was just sort of training my brain um, and getting it, to be in the right place to make good stuff. Um, Cause all this other stuff you can learn, you know, how do you use premiere? I don't know. Go on YouTube. Half the time, dude, I'll do a project and I'll forget how to use, cause I haven't color graded in months mm-hmm. and my color grade, my color grade guy may, may bail on me. And it's like, all right, I know that I have the skills to do that. I just don't remember how to fucking do it. Yep. So I'll literally pull up YouTube and at the same time that I'm grading, be like scrubbing through and going, <laughs> how the fuck do I render? Okay, there it is. There's the right yep. <laughs> um, mm. That shit's easy. 
And that's the stuff that I think that they celebrate so hard on YouTube right now, where it's like, this is how you fucking run this thing out. This is how you do this sweet effect. It's the other shit that no one's really talking about. Like, how do I get my brain in the right place? Where do I find confidence? How do I trust myself? How do I listen to people? That's the shit. You know? Because all that other shit's going to change a hundred fucking times before the years are. True. Yeah. Yeah. And the the hobby thing, like you were saying earlier, the importance of being able to take an idea. All right. I'm getting nowhere. You realize that. Realize that right away. Don't get stuck with the writer block in a room. Walk away from it for a little bit. See what that does. Come back to it. Like, I think that's a very important thing to learn how to do that as well. Instead of wasting your time when time is such a critical thing. Like, if you, especially as a freelancer, if you're trying to have 100 irons in the fire. Yeah. Yeah, dude. And, and with ideas, like, I find that I have good ideas all the time. And what I try to do, I haven't been doing it lately. But what I try to do is I write them down. So I'll just put them in a book somewhere. And I'll have, like, a really cool idea. Like, I had an idea years ago that I want to do things with something with paramedics. Mm. Or I had a I had an idea that I wanted to do something about that Russian drill site, which 12 cam, my short film takes place at mm-hmm. probably four years before I made that short. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I had the head injury and I lost control of my inner voice and I lost control of all that sort of stuff. And I need to come up with an origin for it. I went, oh, what about that fucking Russian thing? Mm. And that all sort of made sense at that point. But I physically just had to write it down. And you come up with ideas on a daily basis of like, this would be rad. And it could be the smallest thing. The way that sun's coming through that tree, that's fucking cool. Mm-hmm. And they just write that thing down and you put it away. And it ends up becoming like a supplement to your inspiration folder. Sometimes you're just like flipping through it. Yep. Now, could you give me a perspective? Because I'm a, I'm a note taker too, as well, and Jesse definitely is. Mm-hmm. Is there any method for your organization of these notes of like random shot ideas or story ideas that could be worked with as clay one day? I don't know if there, I don't know. If are you a guy that has notebooks everywhere? Because that's what I am. Like I got yeah. notebooks every fucking where, dude. And they got like random things, and I'll just look through them, and it'll spark an idea here and there. Or other times, I'll be like, "What the fuck was I saying here?" You know. But that's that, that's why they're so great. I think if they're True. too organized, then they lose the, the, the then you lose the sense of discovery. There's something oh, yeah, really nice that's... being able to pick up a book mm. and just go, "Oh, what the fuck was this?" Ah, mm-hmm. and then it's new. That's you know like I mean? one of the coolest feelings. Is like I forgot I had this totally cool idea for a horror movie in a mall at Christmas time. Holy shit! Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When, did I, when the hell did I write that down? I gotta write that. Yeah, and 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 then that becomes part of your process. Where not only are you writing, but you're reading old things. Mm. And so then you're just sort of going through stuff or like, I'll go, like, I'm a big comic book nerd. So I'll go through old issues and flip through issues that I haven't read in, in a long time and then see it again with fresh eyes and be like, this is fucking fascinating. And that's interesting. Or I'll do sketches and I'll sketch things out and I have sketchbooks. Um, or even the same thing with watching movies, like going back and watching older movies. Like I, I try to do a lot of research before I do my storyboarding um, on the language that I want to use mm. and the visual language that I want to use. And I'll go watch a lot of the filmmakers that use specific language t- to get specific emotions. Mm. And so I'll go back and I'll watch their stuff and be like, fuck. Like I, I went and I watched... Um, uh, Indiana Jones, uh, Lost Ark, the first oh, one. Nice. Yeah. And there are like two scenes that had my jaw on the floor. And I've seen that movie a hundred fucking times. Um, and there's that one scene where Brody goes to Indy's house to tell him that they, that he got the approval for him to go on the adventure. Um, and so it's a one shot and he steps in this house and it's this one shot where, Indy opens the door and Brody walks in and the camera turns and they go into what looks like Indy's bedroom slash office. And he's in there packing a suitcase while Brody's telling him all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a beautiful scene. It's all shot in one take and it goes on for like two and a half, three minutes. Oh, wow. And the coverage in it is so fucking inspiring. And I'm just watching the positioning of the actors positioning of of camera 
the lighting techniques that are happening and the, the, the blocking that happens where someone's silhouetted and they're not silhouetted, and then how the lines are delivered and the sounds that you're hearing. And so you watch this whole scene and I'm just like, fuck yeah. And I didn't need to watch the rest of the movie. I literally just needed to see it to that point where I went, ah, I'm going to do my scene with the same language that this scene has, mm. but make it my own. But that's so important. And, and finding that little moment was a really good part. I actually, when this movie's done, I'll be talking about the story again. And that'll be like that moment sort of defined the language wow. for the opening of this film, you know? The next step in stone to your creative art, man. And yeah, right. finding that, right? Dude, you just don't know. Like, and I think it's just about being open and just being aware and not putting st- so many people come in this business with like, my dad didn't love me. So I'm going to show him or like it's more like punk rock to me, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you just don't, you don't want that stress on it because then you're consistently looking at that going like, am I doing enough to prove this? Am I, am I fucking, and, and that stress is sort of closing your brain down yeah. to seeing all this really, really cool, inspiring shit that's around you. Man. I hope that well, makes sense. I'm fucking rambling. At no, that sense. makes oh, total sense. I, I was going to say, I, I have another question. One thing I've noticed um, that seems to be a theme, at least in, in Hollywood and stuff, is that people seem to go further together. You know, like the old saying is, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go further, go together. Um, one that always comes to mind as an example is Adam Sandler's uh, Happy Madison productions always seem to use the same people and they've done stuff for years. Mm. Uh, how important is like a group or a crew or get like having that, that close knit network to having success in this industry? Dude, I really love it. Um, it's a hard thing to, because All right. So finding, finding your crew is, is, is simultaneously the easiest thing and the most difficult thing. I think finding your crew can be an easy thing. And I think sorting through it is difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, and this comes back to what I was saying before, go PA, go PA. The people that you work with when you first start are the people that are going to be with you the longest. And there'll be people from that period that are still with you. There are guys that I have been working with or that I've known for 19 years. Um, and guys that have been on my sets that I will continuously invite them to be on my sets because I love them so much and I like the experience that they, they do. Um, it's really important to have people around you that understand how you handle stress and understand how you process those long, crazy fucking hours. Like I have crew guys that I can turn to them at the, at the fucking 14th hour and just my mouth isn't working anymore. And I can literally just turn to them and be like, ah, shout. and they go right, light, left, right. Got it. Good. And they just know what it is that I like and what it is that I'm trying to do and trying to explain. Uh, and I feel like they're really important to have around you. Uh, there's a, there's, there's a dark side to it too. There are two different types of people. I think there are the people in the industry that are excited, that want to form relationships, that are passionate, that are doing it for the right reasons and they want to throttle forward. And then there are the people that get into this business uh, because it, it's like stature thing. They're, they're trying to prove themselves. There's this some sort of like selfish sort of, darkness that's in there and a lot of times those people can be really toxic mm. and so what you when you're exposed to all of those and especially early on people even the toxic ones know how to get their way in where they're just like i'm really excited to work with you and you're like great and then the next thing you know a year or two years from now you're just like why are you always bitching why are you the first one to complain about how long we're going to <laughs> like, where was why that the excitement fuck from before yeah, like so, you start to you start to find it starts to sort itself out, and you start to see how life is influencing their goals. You start to see all that shit, and then you have to be in the right mindset to be able to separate yourself from that, which is difficult because then, for me, I used to have a business. I had a company in in the East Coast, and I and I I, I felt 
sort of like a fathership position and sort of a, a provider position for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And and then that was sort of running my life for a while where it's like, I got to pick up, even though I don't want to do this work, I got to pick up this work because I know this person needs money and I know this person needs mm-hmm. money. And, and so then it's really easy to fall into that, that mode where I think if you just sort through it and you really find those people that are long run, long goal, passionate, um, and they fit into the whole process love where they're like, dude, we're in this for the fucking ride, man. Like, this is great. The, you, you really sort of gravitate those, to those people. Mm-hmm. And you're like, all right, ride or, <laughs> ride or die, man. Like, we're in it together because of that. Um, and then they're really important to have around you, especially like when, I, when, this, when this film pops off, I'm, I'm going to try to texture my crew with as many of my guys as possible because mm-hmm. there's going to be so many new people who don't know my system, who don't know my shit. Um, and I just want to be able to turn to my buds and just be like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? And have them go like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> mm. Or no, you're wrong. Or yeah. you're handling this like an asshole. And then you're like, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. And you know that you can trust their input because you've been with them long enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's a camaraderie they're just, at that point. Yeah. Right. They're not just fueling you with the, your fucking genius shit where it's just like, look, man. <laughs> I know I'm not. <laughs> I, I couldn't even tie my shoes this morning. So no, I'm fucking cheap. Especially um, in a convoluted like uh, industry where there are a lot of people that are power hungry or trying to get their fucking dick in the fucking pool. You know, yep. I mean, it's it's definitely interesting. <laughs> too many dude. dicks in the pool. You know, want oh, that? <laughs> too many dicks stirring the coffee, dude. It's not going to taste right. You know what I mean? Yeah, Wait, dude, what? dude. I I learned so much from. Uh, Surprisingly, I learned so much from uh, Peter and Bobby Farley hmm. uh, years ago because they're Boston boys as well. And uh, years ago, I was doing a, a script that their producer was potentially going to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he wanted me to meet Peter and Bobby and then meet their investors and be on their sets and do this stuff. So I got this really great opportunity um, to go be there. And so I think it was when they did Three Stooges and they did Hall Pass. Oh, cool. So both those movies, I got flown, I got flown to Georgia. Um, and literally like, I remember the first day I met Peter, Peter came up to me and he was like, it's really great to meet you. Let me walk you around. I'll show you the sets. And he was walking me through the space. And I was like, Peter, man, I know what your job is, man. You don't have to be doing this for me. It's fine. You don't have to walk me around. It's just wonderful to be here and to see this stuff. Cause as directors, you don't normally get to see other directors work. Mm. there's sometimes there's like an insecurity there and well, you're a lone know. wolf too. Usually there's like one yeah. director and then you have an assistant director, maybe. But. Yeah. 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 And it, so like sometimes people don't let other directors in because they don't want to be judged. And of course I was young enough. So he has no, he had no reason to, to be stressed <laughs> out about me. Uh, but he was really cool about it. He's like, here's a headset. So he gave me headsets, put me right at the monitor. And he's like, just, watch anything you want, man. And I got to see how they run their sets and they run their sets with their crew and their family. And they bring their like classmates from high school in and those guys are extras in all their movies. So if you oh, watch wow. like me, myself and Irene and Dumb and Dumber, you'll see a lot of the same extras. Okay. Those guys are like buddies from high school. That's funny as hell. I never realized that. Yeah. And so like I, I watching these scenes and I remember I was watching a take I would think it was Hall Pass. I was watching a take on Hall Pass and I'm just immersed. And I have like the headsets on. And the thing that most people don't realize, like if you're looking around the set and the producers are there, they'll put the headsets on for the take. And, you know, like an actor will come tumbling out of the woods and pull a gun and be like, freeze. And everybody goes, that was great. And they take their headsets off. I leave my shit on because then I hear Peter go over and give direction. Nice. The mics are still on. So I'm just like, listening for how he's responding you're in school at that point yeah you're taking all the lessons yeah yeah and so you're just listening to it like it's like oh fuck that's a fascinating way to tell him that he did a bad job without him knowing that (laughs) um and then i watched him go from like a big take big setup and then i watched him walk over and talk to the boom up Mm -hmm. and it was just this guy standing there with a boom pole 
And he walks over and he's like, what do you think of that scene? And the boom up was just like, no, I didn't really like the performances. I didn't, I thought the blocking was a little rocky based upon the cover, whatever the fuck he said, but he, he said it without looking at the director and be like, Oh fuck. He was just like, no, this is what I think. Mm. And then Peter was like, you're right. And walked and made those changes. Wow. And then I, I think I talked to the boom up and he was just like, Oh, I've known him for years. And it's like, that's it. man. Okay. Yeah. That's what you want. You want that. You want that, those people around you where you can just go over to them and go, what the fuck? And, and I, I actually tried to instill that when I did uh, who's there, which is my other proof of concept. I made that, we ended up shooting that it was one of the best sets that I've ever had. And we ended up shooting that in this old house built in the early 1800s in new England. And, uh, this big old house looked like a Guillermo del Toro set. And we got snowed in. So there was a blizzard and we were doing overnight. So we just got snowed in and kept shooting. Um, but what I did on that set is we had enough room where I had a whole separate room sealed off with a video feed going into it. And then I just had friends in that room watching. Mm -hmm. it. And so I would go do a take. And if I really wasn't feeling strong about that take, I'd go into that room, which I'd never really let the actors in. I'd go into that room and go, close the door and go, what do you guys think? Hmm. And I get that feedback from, from people Damn. that didn't the business. That's crazy. That's like having that, that direct that you can never really get that direct feedback from an audience unless you <laughs> literally set up a separate room next to your, uh, your set there. That's crazy. It was, it was cool, man. Cause then you're sitting there and you're just getting it. Sometimes their feedback, some people feel like they have to give you feedback because you ask and you sort of filter through that. But you're just like, you've got a problem with this. And I can see that you got a problem with this. So I'm going to go figure that out. Mm. It was really good. Mm. And it worked out really well. That's cool. That's interesting. It's like one of the final stages of film, like after the movie's done and, yeah. and editing. You're introducing it in the very beginning. Like Production while you're doing it, you're like yeah. fucking, what's up with this? Oh, I'm going to avoid an idea that's going to be a conflict in post right now. Bang. Let's go back to the shooting. Like That's, that's an attention I, to detail right there. I've never heard yeah. about like anybody doing that. Yeah, it, it was fun, dude. It, it's always like something stupid. Like, uh, like my mother was there and I love having her around because she doesn't keep her mouth shut. <laughs> and who's and more so honest than mom? Who's more honest? Yeah, in check me. for sure. And she'll just come right out and be like, the way she's wearing that coat. <laughs> wear the coat that way. And I'm just like, really? The coat's bothering you? And she's like, yeah, yeah. You gotta fix that fucking coat. So you're just staring at the coat the whole time? Yeah. All right, I'll go do something about the coat. Well, she's point. not alone. Most likely somebody else out there, they watch your art, man. And then they're going to be hung up on that scene. And they, that could be a kill point for a film or something, you know, for that's, a, uh, the, right, the wrong person. Right. And that's the other perspectives in, that you were talking about before the, the empathy that you get as a, you trying to capture as a director for how other people are going to see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's fascinating, man. And there are no rules. There are systems. There, there are steps. You know, block, light, shoot, block a scene, light a scene, shoot a scene. There are rules that um, that work, but there, there, there's no definitive. Mm -hmm. If I do this, A plus B is going to equal C. It doesn't fucking exist that way. And so you're trying to look around at how other people do it and find little nuggets that you think will apply to the crazy world that you've built for yourself. Mm -hmm. Use the steps in uh, systems as a skeleton, and then you build the meat. You know, exactly. basically, it exactly. all comes back to meat in this episode, dude. doesn't it? <laughs> meat in our mouths, always, man. always does, dude. It dude, in an does. industry with passion required, there is no shortage with you, dude. And this has been nothing short of fucking inspirational, educational, and fucking fun, man. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Mike. Uh, real quick, before we get out of here, man, do you want to shoot some plugs? How do the people find all the crazy? things you've been involved in uh the easiest way to keep up with me uh, i'm on instagram all the time so keep following me at my pet on instagram i'm there all the time if you want to listen to the podcast it's called in love with the process you'll find that on spotify you'll find that on apple podcast or you can just go to love with the .com, and there i've curated the show so like you can because we're like 80 i think i just recorded like 86 nice. uh so there are a lot of episodes. So if you're new and you're like, fuck, like, where do I start? 
Uh, you can listen to the first episode if you want to be set up, and then you can choose your episodes based upon the subject material that you're into. Nice. Um, nice. You don't have to worry about con- – I mean, continuity is fun, but you don't have to worry about continuity if you get into that. Or you can go to MikePetchy.com, and there is where I basically put up all the stuff that I've done. Um, and the only way to see my shorts, because I haven't released them to the public – so the only way to see my shorts is you got to write to me on Instagram and tell me your three favorite horror movies. And if I agree with you, then maybe I'll send you a link. Well, I think we're going to have a little homework to do after this interview then. hundred <laughs> percent. Oh man. Well, thank you again for coming on, man. Uh, it's fucking, we'll have to do this again. Check up on you. Once these movies get greenlit. We'll see what we'll have to maybe we'll get a fucking exclusive view in. I don't know. We'll have to work that out after. <laughs> Dude, yeah, no, you guys have been great. So uh, feel free to reach out anytime. And Hell yeah, uh, we'll see. Fingers fucking crossed. You know Dude, what I'm saying? You got an extra got, pair over here. Yeah, two pairs right here, dude. <laughs> All right, Bye. people. Thank you for tuning in at home. Uh, we love each and every one of you. Until next time, that's it. There you go. We're smoking the America. America. We passing the passing. I'm mapping America, America. I'm second America, America. We talking America, America. We blazing America, America. This is fucking America, America. We're second America, America. This has been American Slacker Podcast. You can reach the show by searching American Slacker on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Reddit, or send them an email to American Slacker Podcast at gmail.com. You can download and rate American Slacker on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, and all other podcast platforms. Visit the show's website, aspodcast.com, where you will find every episode, official merchandise, and links to their Patreon if you would like to support American Slacker. We're smoking America, America. We're passing America. I'm mapping America.